Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, I'm going to be walking you through how my homebrew engine control module works and show you how you too can build a similar module using the open source Gerber files, CAD files, and software published on GitHub. Let's get started. It's super important for me to note that although the system is open source and anyone on the internet is more than welcome to download the files, modify them, and implement them on your own vehicles, it is very much an experimental system. In addition to the hazards inherent with using pressurized gasoline in any sort of a homebrew experiment, and with the high voltages involved in spark ignition, which this system also covers, there is always the risk that this system will malfunction, resulting in potential loss of power or damage to the engine as a result of detonation or other problems. Because this system leaves all of the parameters of tuning completely open to the end user, it is up to you to make sure that you don't set your timing or fuel settings in such a way that you damage the engine through early timing, late timing, too much fuel, too little fuel, or any of the above at the wrong time or in the wrong condition. It's also notable that these electronics are all hobbyist grade electronics and should not be trusted with the same level of expectation as something like an off the shelf ECM system for a modern car or a retrofit kit such as a Holly Sniper or a Mega Squirt system. As a result, should you choose to implement anything you see in this video or on GitHub on a roadworthy vehicle, be advised you are very much doing so at your own risk and use your common sense when doing so. In a previous video on this channel, I walked through a very simple speed density control electronic fuel injection system that I designed for the dune buggy project long, long ago. This fairly simple system basically took two signal inputs, namely a manifold absolute pressure signal, which it used as a density signal, and an engine RPM signal from the distributor, which it used as a speed signal. By multiplying these together and scaling them appropriately, the necessary amount of fuel required to be metered into the engine by the fuel injector could be tabulated and as a result dispensed by the fuel injector. The goal of this system was to maintain a fixed air to fuel ratio at all times during the engine's operation to ensure that the engine doesn't run too rich or too lean throughout its operation. Since publishing that video, I've made a huge number of improvements to both the software side and hardware side of the project. Although the system is fundamentally still a simple speed density control system, relying on only two input sensors to derive the necessary information to dispense the fuel, I've added a considerable number of tweaks, modifications, and upgrades to the system to make it considerably improved over its original design. Some of the key software improvements for the fuel injection controller include an AFR table, allowing various air fuel ratios to be set over ranges of RPM and ranges of manifold pressure in order to optimize the performance of the engine for different operating regions. I've also added a minimum idle duty cycle setting, which allows a stable idle to be achieved that doesn't rely on the relatively slow map sensor to track the manifold pressure at idle where it can fluctuate significantly. I've added the capability to operate the program in pulse frequency modulation at low duty cycles in order to reduce the likelihood of an injector staying closed at very low uh, fuel injection duty cycles. I've additionally included a rate of change of manifold absolute pressure or rate of change of map system to emulate an accelerator pump. This effectively adds a little extra fuel when the map pressure changes rapidly in order to emulate the effect of an accelerator pump in a carburetor without the need for a throttle position sensor. Finally, I've additionally added a rich idle startup timer, which allows a slightly a richer minimum idle duty cycle to be set for a fixed period of time when the engine is first started. This makes it considerably more stable and reliable at starting during cold weather and initial starting events. Another significant addition to this implementation of the system is the support for a high energy ignition or HEI ignition system that is directly computer controlled. I've set up the software to be able to simultaneously operate the EFI system and this high energy ignition system all within the same Arduino Nano ATmega chip. This is really useful because it allows one chip to effectively control an entire engine both on the fuel delivery side and on the spark ignition side. It's also fortuitous having this capability because the ignition pulses that are brought in from the distributor, either from the original points or from a separately installed optical or magnetic interrupter circuit, can be used to simultaneously drive the ignition coil and thus the spark plugs 
and control the RPM measurements for the H or the electronic fuel injection system. Not only does the use of an HEI system improve the quality of spark and thus combustion quality within the engine, but it also allows a significant amount of computer control over the timing to be performed. In particular, my implementation of this software provides support for mechanical advanced emulation and vacuum advanced emulation in both the positive or negative direction of the output spark based on the signals being measured from the MAP sensor and from the RPM itself. Because the computer now has complete control over the engine ignition, I can also implement a rev limiter. It's much safer to implement a rev limiter by cutting spark than it is by cutting fuel. And with access to the ignition system, it's trivial to shut off spark in the event that an upper limit on RPM is exceeded. Although the system currently only supports a single ignition coil and still relies on the cap and rotor of the distributor to take the spark and distribute it to the appropriate cylinders, I am actively working on a four coil independent ignition system where each individual spark plug on each individual cylinder can, with the appropriate optical or magnetic distributor pickup, be used independently to drive these spark ignition timings. Now let's go ahead and take a deep dive into how this printed circuit board implementation of the ECM works and how I designed it. To start off, I designed this in a program called Autodesk Eagle, which is a PCP design software that you can acquire for free as a student or for a small fee as a professional. As with most PCB design suites, Eagle separates this design into two parts, a one-line diagram schematic and a board layout file. Now let's take a look at the schematic file. As you can see, I've constructed this ECM design around an Arduino Nano, just like all previous iterations of the design. The Nano board can either be directly soldered onto the PCB, or a set of pin headers can be installed and soldered onto the board into which the Nano is inserted. Connected to the Nano, we have a few lines going out. We have a green LED which indicates the status of the system and is connected to the pin 13 on the Nano, which also corresponds to its LED indicator on the board itself. We also have a red LED connected to the Nano directly. This red LED is being used as a red line detection uh, LED, which lights up if an over rev condition is detected by the Nano. We have some other LEDs connected to it, including one for the indication of fuel injector operation and one for indication of the spark coil ignition operation. These are also connected directly to the same output lines which drive the transistor drivers and subsequently the power MOSFETs which control all of these functions. A third power MOSFET is also available as a backup and also for use in controlling other devices such as idle air control valves or other pumps or other solenoids which might need to be implemented in the future. In other words, there are a total of three power MOSFET outputs on this board. Each of these power MOSFETs is driven via a level shifter. The 5 volt logic level driven by the Nano into these level shifters is converted into a 10 volt logic level which drives the gates of the power MOSFETs. These IRFP 460s are robust beasts and can withstand a lot of avalanche energy. They also break down at over 600 volts. As a result, they are quite optimal for both ignition and fuel injection control and they hold up very nicely to the abuse associated with the back EMF on these loads. We have these driven to a set of uh, screw terminal breakouts, including, as I said, breakouts for the coils, the injectors, and an auxiliary breakout for something like a solenoid valve. As to the power management on this board, I've taken care to harden the board against transients and other phenomena which could damage the sensitive electronics. The 12 volt signal, which is nominally 12 volts, but could go up as high as 14 and a half volts during normal operation of the alternator and can surge to even higher values than this, is first brought in via an eight amp fuse and is protected by an initial Zener diode, which is tuned to break down at about 22 volts. This 22 volt supply is then fed to a boost converter module, an XL6009, which is a common low power boost converter. This module ensures that during cranking and other low voltage conditions, a steady supply of 12 volts or above is always provided to the subsequent circuitry. The output of that boost converter is then checked by another 22 volt Zener diode in case of any transients from the boost converter and is then sent to a pair of linear regulators. These are both five volt regulators. However, one of them has its ground pin tied to the output of the other regulator. 
and as a result we get a both a 5 volt and a 10 volt power rail for use in the circuitry. These are heavily filtered by both electrolytic and ceramic capacitors to take up any ripple or oscillation in the voltage on both the input and the output of these regulators, and both of these voltage levels are provided for subsequent use in the circuit. The 10 volt logic level is pretty much used exclusively for gate driving for the power MOSFETs, and the 5 volt logic level goes to powering the Arduino Nano, as well as any output auxiliary uh, or input auxiliary sources, such as the MAP sensor or any other analog sensors. Speaking of analog sensors, I've provided four independent analog sensor connection points with 5 volt power, signal in, and ground connected to each input. These are all filtered with 100 nanofarad capacitors at their analog inputs to reduce any spurious triggering or spurious uh, signal interference from the wiring in the vehicle. Overall, this system is designed to drive pretty high loads. Uh, the uh, fuel injector inputs are driven at up to around uh, 2 amps per injector, and those are connected directly to the input just after the 8 amp fuse. The uh, coil pack itself is designed to give very brief pulses of up to 8 amps, but on average is only designed to draw between 2 and 4 amps, and that is connected to the output of the XL6009 module. This ensures that a high 12 volt supply is always available to the coil, even during uh, conditions where the input voltage to the board is quite low, for example during cranking. One last part of this circuit that's worth mentioning is the points pickup system. This is designed to be connected directly to an old-fashioned mechanical point system and includes a power resistor to drive that with a, about 100 milliamps to 150 milliamps of current at all times. This allows the points to either go open circuit, resulting in a high state at that input, or close that circuit to ground and result in a low state at that input. The point signal is then picked up, filtered, and protected against overvoltage at the microcontroller input pin by a 4.7 volt Zener diode. Now that we've taken a look at the schematic design for this ECM, let's take a look at the physical board layout associated with that schematic. As with most PCB design suites, Eagle associates each component in the schematic with a relevant footprint for that physical component that can then be placed on the board. The electrical connections between the relevant footprints show up as what are called rat lines, or straight connections between the individual pads or pins on each component that indicate to the user of the program where a trace or copper link needs to be routed to make that appropriate connection. A final design rule check can be performed to ensure that all of the routings of copper in the schematic or in the uh, board file correspond to the appropriate connections made in the schematic. I wanted to note that I've gone out of my way to make this board as easy as possible to put together by a person with very beginner skills in soldering. I've used exclusively through-hole components on the board, and I've picked out components which, although not necessarily the most compact or highest performance, are very widely available on the internet and should be widely available to most people who are interested in building this. Although the use of surface mount components would have made the board a little bit more compact, and the use of more exotic transistors and integrated circuits could have made it a little bit higher power handling and perhaps a little bit more thermally efficient, I found that this combination of through-hole components and widely available power devices is more than adequate for general purpose four-cylinder engine operation. Going through the board, the first thing that is noticeable here is the Arduino Nano. As I mentioned earlier, this can be installed either directly by soldering the pins of the Nano to the board, or by installing female pin headers into which the Arduino Nano module can then be inserted, in case replacement of the module is ever desired. Directly connected to this module are a bank of analog inputs. They provide a signal input, a negative and positive supply of 5 volts to the sensor. Analog input 0 here is typically connected directly to the MAP sensor, or Manifold Absolute Pressure Sensor, and the other analog inputs are left to the user for use in things like uh, additional pressure sensor sensors, thermometers for measuring air temperature, or other sensors that might be of interest. Down near the bottom of the board here, we have power conversion and power protection uh, circuitry. We have our main input fuse connected to our 12 volt input here. We have our pair of Zener diodes protecting the input and output of the boost converter. We have our linear regulators, and we have the boost converter module itself all ready to be installed in this region of the board. Near the middle of the board here, we can see the three level shifter circuits, which use transistors and resistors 
to convert the 5 volt level logic into 10 volt level logic to drive the power MOSFETs, which we see here along the right side of the board. These power MOSFETs are connected to their respective terminal blocks where wires leading to the respective components on the engine can be connected. Finally, up near the top of the board we can see the LEDs and their respective resistors. Here we have an LED to indicate the activity of the fuel injectors, an LED to indicate activity of the ignition coil, and LEDs to indicate the system status and whether the red line or over rev detection is being activated. Here's a look at what the PCB looks like after it's been manufactured and after it's been assembled. Now this version has been slightly modified from its original layout. I've actually taken the corners off of it on all four sides just to make it fit into the plastic enclosure that I selected a little bit more effectively. Other than that, all of the components have been populated pretty much per their specifications. Now one modification I do want to mention is I've added a small copper screen with a piece of insulating fish paper just over the ATmega328P chip on the Arduino Nano and in order to cover the uh, little oscillator crystal that's next to the ATmega328P. This is a highly recommended modification that I would suggest for anyone putting an Arduino Nano or similar board into an automotive type application. And the reason for that is in the automotive applications like this, there's a very large range of RF and electromagnetic interference sources that can adversely affect the performance of the microcontroller and can even cause it to crash in the middle of the operation. I did have that happen a few times with this original system, but as soon as I added this little screen and this little piece of paper, it never once crashed again. In fact, I could even get the uh, spark plug wires right up against this without having any adverse effects on the microcontroller. So other than those two modifications, this board has been more or less assembled exactly as it is specified by the labels and values on the board itself, and this is exactly what you should expect to get if you have this board manufactured at a place like PCBWay, JLC PCB, or any of the other major PCB manufacturing houses. Let's have a look at how this ECM system is configured on a VW-based dune buggy project. On this 1776cc VW engine, we can see that we have our engine control module mounted to the fan shroud inside a plastic enclosure with some ventilation. Out of the bottom of this enclosure, we have a number of conductors routed to their respective locations on the engine. One such pair of conductors runs to this ignition coil, which is a standard low-cost, high-energy ignition coil that would be used on pretty much any other uh, electronically controlled ignition engine. The output of this single coil is routed to the center of the stock VW distributor, where the sparks generated by the coil are routed to their respective cylinders by the rotor inside of the distributor. Another set of conductors runs to the fuel injectors, which are mounted on my custom-made EFI manifold, which I showed in an earlier video. These are high-flow 440cc per minute injectors, and they are being driven directly off the ECM and supplied with a 58 PSI fuel rail from the front of the vehicle where the fuel pump and filter are located. We also have a vacuum takeoff from this manifold. This vacuum takeoff wraps around to a MAP sensor on the back of the manifold, which is then connected electronically back to the ECM via the analog input. That provides information to the ECM about the pressure inside the manifold and allows it to calculate its speed density fuel dispensing requirements. Finally, we have an input to the ECM from the distributor. This input is designed to be used and will work with traditional distributor points. However, I have a slightly more sophisticated way of measuring the timing of my engine ignition. Let's take a look. Having a look inside the distributor, you can see that I've replaced the mechanical breaker points with a circuit board. This circuit board has a set of optical interrupt switches attached to it. These interrupt switches detect when the two flaps which I've attached to the bottom of the rotor cross through their beams and thus result in an electronic output signal from the switches. This is timed in such a way that the output of this board exactly emulates the effect of the original breaker points without having any electrical parts that have to make contact and could be prone to corrosion. In addition to that capability, the system is also really cool because by sending two separate signals out to the ECM, I, in the future I'm actually going to be able to implement a four coil system where every single spark plug has its own coil and there's no more need for a cap and rotor distributor on top of this system. Now right now I'm still using the system just like the regular breaker points 
and as a result, this is totally backwards compatible with an old style breaker point system. But it does leave a lot of cool opportunities to implement a more robust and less electrically noisy system using independent coils rather than one coil and a distributor. So if you're interested in going out and building your own system based on this platform, the first thing you'll want to do is go onto GitHub and download all of the necessary files to build the system. You can find the spreadsheet bill of materials here, which you can use to buy all of the individual electronic components required for the PCB. Typically, I will go to DigiKey to buy these, but you can go to other websites and vendors as well. Additionally, you may want to acquire the mechanical and fuel handling components within this system, which are also listed within the bill of materials. You can certainly find substitutes for all of these if you want to, uh, and really it'll be application specific based on the needs of your vehicle, but these are a few suggested items that you can use for the fuel handling and spark ignition sides of the project. After you've acquired all of the components, you'll want to look into getting the PCB produced. The Gerber files, which are zipped up in the JLC PCB preferred format, can be used to purchase PCBs through a company like JLC PCB or one of their competitors. I tend to prefer JLC PCB, but there are lots of PCB manufacturing houses out there, and more or less all of them should be able to take these industry standard Gerber files and use them to produce the boards, which they can then ship to your house. Once you have access to the boards, you can solder the components onto the boards based on the labeling that's placed on the board silkscreen layers and start testing the system out for yourself. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something about the way I've implemented this EFI slash ECM system, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching Dielectric Videos. I'll see you next time.